God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. tuned to Limelight Productions' radio broadcast of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. This production is in lieu of a false show, as we are currently in the midst of a global pandemic here in 2020. Consider making a financial contribution to our theatre company by clicking on the link below and donating whatever you feel is right. Thank you in advance for your support. And now, A Christmas Carol. Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. This must be distinctly understood or nothing wonderful can come of the story I'm going to relate. So, remember, Old Marley was as dead as a doornail. The registrar of his burial was signed by Ebenezer Scrooge. And Scrooge's name was good on the London Exchange for anything he chose to put his hand to. Mr. Scrooge, sir. Who are you? Samuel Wilson, sir. Oh, yes. You owe me a little matter of 20-odd pounds, I believe. Well, if you want to pay it, come to my place of business. I don't conduct my affairs in the teeth of inclement weather. I, I can't pay you, sir. I'm not surprised. Not unless you give me more time. Did I ask you for more time to lend you the money? Oh, no, sir. Then why should you ask for more time to pay it back? I can't take my wife to a debtor's prison. Then leave her behind. Why should she go to a debtor's prison anyway? She didn't borrow the 20 pounds you did. What has your wife got to do with it? For that matter, what have I got to do with it? Good afternoon. But Mr. Scrooge, it's Christmas. Christmas has even less to do with it, my dear sir, than your wife has or I have. You'd still owe me 20 pounds that you're not in the position to repay if it was in the middle of a heat wave on August bank holiday. Good afternoon. A Merry Christmas, Uncle. God save you. Ah, humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle. You don't mean that, I'm sure. I do. Merry Christmas. What a right have you to be merry? You're poor enough. Oh, come then. What right do you have to be dismal? What right do you have to be morose? You're rich enough. Bah. Humbug. Oh, don't be cross, uncle. What else can I be when I live in such a world of fools as this? Merry Christmas. Out upon a merry Christmas. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? A time for finding yourself a year older, but not an hour richer. If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart he should. Uncle! Nephew! Keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? 
But you don't keep it. Let me leave it alone, then. Much good may it do you. Much good has it ever done you. There are many things from which I might have derived good, by which I have not profited, I dare say. Christmas among the rest. But I am sure I have always thought of Christmas time when it has come around. Apart from the veneration due to its sacred name and origin, if anything belonging to it can be apart from that, as a good time. A kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. The only time I know of in the long calendar of the year when men and women seem to be seen by one consent to open their shut-up hearts freely and to think of people below them as if they were really fellow passengers to the grave and not another race of creatures bound on their other journeys. And therefore, uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good and it will do me good. And I say, God bless it! Oh. Let me hear another sound from you, Cratchit, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your job! You're quite a powerful speaker, sir. I wonder you don't go into Parliament. Don't be angry, Uncle. Come! Dine with us tomorrow. Will you come see us? Oh, I'll see you, all right. I'll see you in hell. But why? Why? Why did you get married? Because I fell in love. Because you fell in love. Ha! Good afternoon. Uncle, you never came to see me before that happened. Why give it a reason for not coming now? Good afternoon. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why can't we be friends? Good afternoon. I am sorry with all my heart. To find you so resolute. We have never had any quarrel to which I have been party. But I have made the trial homage to Christmas. And I'll keep my Christmas humor to the last. So a Merry Christmas, Uncle. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. How is Mrs. Cratchit and all the small assorted Cratchits? Oh, very good, sir. All champing at the bit waiting for Christmas to begin, eh? Oh, yes, sir. All very eager. And the little lame boy, uh, which one is he, um, Tim? Tim, sir. That's right. Uh, how is he? We're in high hopes he's getting better, sir. Oh, good. A Merry Christmas to you. Same to you, sir, I'm sure. Thank you. And you. Fifteen shillings a week and a wife and family talking about a Merry Christmas. Well, retire to bed, mum. <laughs> Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. Have I the pleasure of addressing Miss Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley has been dead these seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. Oh. We have no doubt his liberality is well represented by his surviving partner. At this festive season a year, Mr. Scrooge, it's more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute. Who suffer greatly at this present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessities. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comfort, sir. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons. And the Union workhouses. Are they still in operation? Oh, they are. Still. I wish I could say they were not. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigour, then? Both very busy, sir. No. I was afraid from what you had said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course. But I'm very glad to hear it. A few of us are attempting to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. What shall I put you down for? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> you wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone. Since you ask me what I wish, gentlemen, that is my answer. I don't make merry myself at Christmas, and I can't afford to make idle people merry. I help to support the establishments I have mentioned. They cost enough, and those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, they had better do it, and decrease the surplus population. Besides, excuse me, I don't know that. But you might know it. It's not my business. 
It's enough for a man to understand his own business, and not to interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Excuse me, sir. A carol, sir. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing... Off with you! Ah! I'm sorry, sir! You won't all day tomorrow, I suppose. If quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'll be bound. And yet, you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. It's only once a year, Mr. Scrooge. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose you must have the whole day. Be here all the earlier next morning. I will. I promise. Uh. Scrooge. Molly? Marley's face, not an impenetrable shadow as the other objects in the yard are, but with a dismal light about it like a bad lobster in a dark cellar. Not angry or ferocious, but looked at Scrooge as Marley used to look, with ghostly spectacles turned upon its ghostly forehead, the hair curiously stirred as if by breath or hot air, eyes wide open but perfectly motionless. That and its livid color make it horrible. But its horror seems to be in spite of the face and beyond its control, rather than a part of its own expression. Bedroom as usual. Nobody under the bed, nobody in the closet. Ah! Only my dressing gown. I'm up in a suspicious attitude against the wall. It's humbug still. I won't believe it. How now? What do you want with me? Much. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? In my life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Can you... can you sit down? I can. Do it then! You don't believe in me. I don't. What evidence would you have of my reality beyond that of your senses? I don't know. What do you do with your senses? Because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheat. You may be an undigested bit of beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. There's more of gravy than of grave about you, whatever you are. You see this toothpick? I do. You are not looking at it. But I see it, notwithstanding. Well! I have but to swallow this and be for the rest of my days persecuted by a legion of goblins all of my own creation. Humbug, I tell you, humbug! <laughs> Mercy! Dreadful apparition, why do you trouble me? Man of the world in mind, do 
Do you believe in me or not? I do. I must, but why do spirits walk the earth and why do they come to me? It's required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit does not go forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world, oh woe is me, and witness what it cannot share but might have shared on earth and turn to happiness. Fettered. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it on on my own free will and on my own free will I wore it. Is its pattern strange to you? Or would you know the weight and length of its strong coil you bear yourself? It was full as heavy and as long as this seven Christmas Eves ago. You have laboured on it since. It is a ponderous chain. Jacob, oh Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have not to give more. It comes from other regions, Ebenezer Scrooge, and is conveyed by other ministers to other kinds of men. Nor can I tell you what I would. A very little more is all permitted to me. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Mark me. In my life, my spirit never roamed beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole and wearing journeys lie before me. You must have been very slow about it, Jacob. Slow? Seven years dead and travelling all the time. No time. No rest. No pace. Incessant torture of remorse. You travel fast? On the wings of the wind. You might have got over a great quantity of ground in seven years. Oh, captive bound in double island, not to know that ages of incessant labor by immortal creatures for this earth must pass into eternity before the good of which is susceptible is all developed. Not to know that any Christian spirit working kindly in its little sphere, whatever it may be, will find its mortal life too short for its vast means of usefulness. Not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one's life's opportunities misused. Yet such was I. Oh, such was I. But you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of the trade were but a drop of water in this comprehensive ocean of my business. At this time of the year, I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds of fellow beings with my eyes turned down and never raised them to that blessed star which led the wise men to a poor abode? Were there no poor homes in which its light would have conducted me? Uh, hear me! My time is nearly gone. I will. But don't be hard upon me. Don't be flowery, Jacob. How it is that I appear before you in a shape you can see, I may not tell. I have sat invisible beside you many and many a day. Uh, that is no light part of my penance. I am here tonight to warn you, and you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate. A chance and hope of my procuring Ebenezer. 
You were always a good friend to me. Thank ye. You will be haunted by three spirits. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? It is. I, I, I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you cannot hope to show the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow when the bell tolls one. Couldn't I take them all at once and have it over, Jacob? Expect the second or the next night on the same hour. The third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more. And look that for your own sake. And remember what has passed between us. We hope you're enjoying Limelight Productions, a Christmas carol, or radio drama. And now, a word from our sponsor. What do I do with all this extra money laying around the house? It's aggravating! Hey, I know what to do. Do you have random money just lying around? Do you hate seeing that miscellaneous coin in the corner of your eye? Bring your extra cash to Scrooge and Marley's Counting House, and you'll never have to worry about seeing it again. Say goodbye to the stress of picking up those annoying coins forever! This commercial is sponsored by Scrooge and Marley's Counting House. We wish you a Merry Christmas! We wish you a Merry Christmas! We wish you a Merry Christmas! Aye, those carols are always ruining my sleep schedule. Singing in the middle of the night. Good thing I know what to use. Carol are repellent! When they come knocking on your door, will they be in for a surprise? Simply grab a bottle from the polar store down the street and you'll never have to worry about hearing those tontos carolers again. Twelve. It was past two when I went to bed. Humph. <sighs> luck must be wrong. Icicle must have gotten to the works. Twelve. Why, it isn't possible. I can't have slept through a whole day and fire into another night. Now, of course, the ghost had warned Mr. Scrooge that a spirit would visit him when the bell tolled one. So, he resolved to lie awake until the hour was past. And considering that he could no more go to sleep than go to heaven, this was perhaps the wisest decision he could make. Naturally, he didn't want to be caught dozing off, so he made sure to set the alarm on his clock to go off precisely at one. Are you the spirit whose coming was foretold to me? I am. Who and what are you? I'm the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. 
I wonder if you might uh, put a hat on. What? Would you so soon put out, with worldly hands, the light I gave? Is it not enough that you are one of those whose passions made this cap and forced me through whole trains of years to wear it low upon my brow? I, I didn't mean to offend. <laughs> uh, what business brings you here? Your welfare. Well, I am much obliged, but I wonder if a good night's sleep wouldn't be more conducive to that end. Your reclamation, then. Take heed. Rise. And walk with me. It's the middle of the night. It's below freezing. I'm wearing slippers, a dressing gown, and a nightcap. I'm mortal, and I'm liable to fall. Bear but a touch of my hand there, and you shall be upheld in more than death. Good heaven! I, w I was bred in this place! I, I was a boy here! Your lip is trembling. I beg you, spirit, lead me where you would. You recollect the way? Remember it? I could walk it blindfold. Strange to have forgotten it for so many years. Let us go on. These are but shadows of the things that have been. They have no consciousness of us. The school is not quite deserted. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. I know it. Oh boy. I, I wish, but it's too late now. What is the matter? Nothing, N nothing. There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my window last night. I should like to have given him something, that's all. Let us see, see another Christmas. My sister, Ben. Ebenezer. Dear, dear brother, I've come to bring you home, dear brother. Bring you home, home, home. Home, little fan. Yes, home. For good and all. Home forever and ever. Father's so much kinder than he used to be. That home's like heaven. For you, perhaps, but not for me. He doesn't even know me or even what I look like. Same as I hardly know you, now that you're quite a woman. He spoke to me so gently one dear night when I was going to bed that I was not afraid to ask him once more if he might come home. And he said, yes, you should, and sent me in a coach to bring you. And you're to be a man and are to never come back here. But first we'll be together all the Christmas long and have the merriest time in the world. You're quite a woman, little fan. Always a delicate creature whom a breath might have withered. But she had a large heart. So she had. She died a woman, and had, as I think, children. One child. True. Your nephew. Yes. Why, it's old Fezziwig. Bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again. Yo ho there, Ebenezer, Dick. Ebenezer here, Mr. Fezziwig. Dick Wilkins here, Mr. Fezziwig. Dick Wilkins, to be sure. Bless me, yes. There he is. He was very much attached to me, was Dick. Poor Dick, dear, dear. Yo ho, my boys. No more work to not. Christmas Eve, Dick! Christmas, Ebenezer! Let's have the shutters up before a man can say Jack Robinson! Ah, 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 ah. Hilly ho, clear away, my lads, and let's have lots of room here. Hilly ho, Dick! Cheer up, Ebenezer! <laughs> Dance! 
Mrs. Fezziwig. Oh, but of course, Mr. Fezziwig. And we young men are left to clean up. A small matter to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. Small? What a sweet old man is Mr. Fessywig. The sweetest. Did you see him dancing with the missus? And the look on his face. Oh, yes. He was in heaven and fully deserved to be. And where the devil did he find that fiddler? Oh, wasn't he marvelous? Nothing's too good for Fezziwig. I'd say this year's party was finer than the last, if such a thing is possible. Fezziwig spent but a few pounds of your mortal money. Three or four, perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves this praise? It isn't that. It isn't that spirit. He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. See that his power lies in words and looks, in things so slight and insignificant that it is impossible to add and count them up. What then? The, the happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. What is the matter? Nothing particular. Something, I think. No. No, I, I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now, that's all. My time grows short. little to you, very little. Another idol has displaced me, and if it can cheer and comfort you in the time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you? <laughs> A golden one. This is the even-handed dealing of the world. There is nothing on which it is so hard as poverty, and there is nothing it professes to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. You fear the world too much! All your other hopes have merged into the hope of being beyond the chance of its sordid reproach. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion, gain, engrosses you. Have I not? What then? Even if I have grown so much wiser, what then? I'm not changed towards you. Am I? Our engagement is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so, until in good season we could improve our worldly fortune by our patient industry. You are changed. When it was made, you were another man. I was a boy. Tis true I am not now what I was then. I am. That which promised happiness when we were in one in heart is fraught with misery now that we are two. How often and how keenly I have thought of this, I will not say. It is enough that I have thought of it, and can release you from our engagement. Have I ever sought release? In words? No. Never. In what, then? In a changed nature. An altered spirit. In another atmosphere of life, another hope as its great end. In everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. If this had never been between us, tell me, would you seek me out and try to win me now? You think not. I would gladly think otherwise if I could, heaven knows! When I have learned a truth like this, I know how strong and irresistible it must be. But if you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can even I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl? You who, in your very confidence with her, weigh everything by gain. Or choosing her, if for a moment you are false enough to your one guiding principle to do so, do I not know that your repentance and regret would surely follow? I do. And I release you from our engagement. With a full heart. For the love of him you once were. You may. The memory of what has passed half makes me hope you will. Have pain in this. 
a very, very brief time, and you will dismiss the recollection of it gladly as an unprofitable dream from which it happened well that you awoke. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. Spirit, show me no more. Conduct me home. Why, why do you delight to torture me? One shadow more. No more. No more. I don't wish to see it. Show me no more. Bed, children. I'll get themselves, Mother. Belle, I saw an old friend of yours this afternoon. <laughs> Who was it? <laughs> Guess. <laughs> How can I? I don't know, Mr. Scrooge. <laughs> <laughs> Scrooge it was. I passed his office window, and as it was not shut up, and he had a candle inside, I could scarcely help seeing him. His partner lies on the point of death, I hear. Very sat. Alone. Quite alone in the world, I do believe. Spirit, remove me from this place! I told you these were shadows of things that have been. That they are what they are. Do not blame me. Remove me! I cannot bear it! Ebenezer! Tell up, Ebenezer! I release you from our engagement. Alone. Quite alone in the world, I do believe. Leave me! Take me back! Haunt me no longer! A room in my house, but all this old stuff is in the way. Well, come on down to Fezziwig's warehouse where we will take all of your old stuff, and I mean all of it. Whether it's old furniture, you left shoe, or even that old metal rod that is a coin flip whether you get tetanus or not if you even look at it. We'll take all of it, even the tetanus! Wait, Jerry, is this right? What do you mean the recording's live? I thought we were pre-recording this thing. The mic's on? This is our only shot. Are your grumpy neighbors using Carolyn repellent against you? Does it take days for your vision to finally return to normal? Dress not, Christmas carolers! I have the product for you. Humbug repellent. If they spray you, you spray right back. Pollute the air with humbug repellent. You can buy this product at the poulterer's store, right next to the caroler repellent. Now back to A Christmas Carol. Now. Marley's ghost had warned Scrooge that a second spirit would haunt him at the stroke of one. I don't mind telling you that Scrooge was now prepared for a good broad field of strange appearances, and that nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros would have astonished him very much. By this time, he was ready for almost anything. don't think I have. I'm afraid I have not. Have you had many brothers, Spirit? Approximately 1842. A tremendous family to provide for. Spirit, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion and I learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my throne! That. What has ever caught your precious father then? And your brother, Tiny Tim? And Martha went his late last Christmas day by half an hour. 
Here's Martha Mother. Here's Martha Mother. There's such a goose, Martha. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are. Oh, we had a deal of work to finish up last night and had to clear away this morning, Mother. Well, never mind, so long as you are come. Sit you down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm. Lord bless you. No, no, with this father coming. Hide, Martha, hide! Why, where's our Martha? Not coming. Not coming? Not coming upon Christmas Day? I'm here, Father. Merry Christmas. And how did little Tim behave in church? As good as gold, and better. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much, and he thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me coming home that he hoped that people in church saw him because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day, who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. He's growing stronger and hardier every day, isn't he? Yes, dear. He is. The goose, the goose is, is caught! The goose, the goose is, is caught! Humph. <laughs> Not much of a goose. I don't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Mmm, so tender. And delicious. And big! And cheap! <laughs> <laughs> it's lovely, Mother. This is a goose we shall remember for as long as we live. Thank you, Tim. A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. God, God bless, bless us. us. God bless us, everyone. 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 Spirit, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. No. No. No, no, kind spirit, say he will be spared. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, none other of my race will find him here. What then? If he be like to die, yet yeah, yeah, yeah. it will and decrease the third class population. I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. My dear, the children, Christmas Day. It should be Christmas Day, I am sure, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, hard, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Robert. Nobody knows it better than you do, poor fellow. My dear, have some charity. It's Christmas Day. I'll drink his health for your sake in the days, not for his. Long life to him, a merry Christmas, and a happy new year. He'll be very merry and very happy. I have no doubt. No doubt. No doubt. <laughs> Fred? <laughs> I was only going to say that the consequence of his taking a dislike to us and not making merry with us is, as I think, that he loses some pleasant moments, which could do him no harm. I am sure he loses pleasanter companions that he can find in his own thoughts, either in his moldy old office or his dusty chambers. I mean, to give him the same chance every year, whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. He may rail at Christmas till he dies, but he can't help but thinking better of it. I defy him. If he finds me going there in good temper year after year and saying, Uncle Scrooge, how are you? If it only puts him in vain to leave his poor clerk 50 pounds, that's, that's something. And I, I think I shook him yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> now then, let's have a game of yes and no. <laughs> Since you're the host, you'll go first. Oh, yes. Oh, you must go. Game. Oh, dear. What do I have to do? Here is a new game. One half hour spirit, only one. You think of something, anything, and the rest of us must find out what it is. But you may only answer our questions, yes or no, as the case may be. <sighs> All right. Well, oh, I've got it. You've thought of something? Yes, fire away. Is it animal, vegetable, or mineral? No, no, no. It has to be a question he can answer yes or no. Are you thinking of an animal? <laughs> yes. Living or dead? <laughs> Is it living? Yes. A wild animal? 
<laughs> well... Can it be found in London? Yes, I'm afraid so. Does it live in a menagerie? Oh, no. Wouldn't go near it. Is it a horse? No. Is it a bear? <laughs> no! Is it a cow? Does it walk the streets? Yes. Is it some kind of rat? No. Maybe a pack rat. Wait! <laughs> Is it a man? <laughs> I have found it out. I know what it is, Fred. I know what it is. No, what is it? What? What is it? It's your Uncle Scrooge. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> hey! That's not fair. When I asked, is it a bear? You should have answered, well, yes! <laughs> <laughs> oh, he has given us plenty of merriment, I am sure. And it would be ungrateful not to drink his health. I say, Uncle Scrooge! Uncle, Uncle Scrooge. Scrooge! A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man. And I wouldn't take it from me, but may he have it, nevertheless. Uncle Scrooge! Your hair is grey. Our spirits' is lives so short. My life is very brief. It ends tonight. Tonight? Tonight at midnight. Forgive me if I am not justified in what I ask, but I see something strange and not belonging to yourself protruding from your skirts. Is it a foot or a claw? It might well be a claw, for all the flesh there is upon it. Look here. There, beneath the robe, was a boy and a girl. Yellow, meager, ragged, scowling, wolfish. But prostrate in their humility, where graceful youth should have filled their features out and touched them with its freshest tints. A stale and shriveled hand, like that of age, has pinched and twisted them and pulled them into shreds. Spirit. Are they yours? They are man's, and they cling to me, appealing from their fathers. This boy is ignorance, this girl is want. Beware them both in all of their degree, but most of all, beware this boy. For on his brow I see that written which is due, unless the writing be erased. Deny it! Have they no refuge or resource? Are there no prisons? Are there no we take a break from your scheduled program for a new edition of a little series we like to call Victorian Games. The show where we give you fun little games to play in this Victorian era. In today's edition of Victorian Games, we would like to introduce you to Blind Man's Bluff. With a group of your friends, pick one to be it and blindfold them. Then spin them around five times like your uncle at a Christmas party after adding a bit too much spice to his eggnog. While they spin, you run and hide in any little place you think they won't get you in the room. After finishing spinning, whoever is it will yell, stop, and the game begins. The person who is it will then aimlessly wander around the room in hopes of finding somebody in their lonely, lonely existence being blindfolded. But it doesn't end there. You can throw, try to throw them off by either dodging without moving your feet or making deceptive noises. For example, throwing a book at one of your fellow hiders. And that's the game. Now go out there and play to your heart's content. And don't forget to tune in next time for another edition of Victorian Games!
midnight. The last of the spirits. I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. You are about to show me shadows of the things that have not happened, but will happen in the time before us. Is that so, spirit? Ghost of the future. I fear you more than any spectre I have seen, but as I know your purpose is to do me good, and as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, I am prepared to bear you company and do it with a thankful heart. Will you not speak to me? Lead on. Lead on. The night is waning fast, and it is precious time to me, I know. Lead on, spirit. Yes. I know these gentlemen. B business associates. No. I don't know much about it either way. I only know he's dead. When did he die? That's not, I believe. Why? What was the matter with him? I thought he'd never die. Oh, God knows. What has he done with his money? I haven't heard. Left it to his company, perhaps. He hasn't left it to me, that's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's likely to be a very cheap funeral, for upon my life, I don't know anybody to go to it. Suppose we make up a party and volunteer? I don't mind going if a lunch is provided, but I must be fed if I make one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am the most disinterested among you, after all, for I never wear black gloves, and I never eat lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll offer to go, if anybody else will. When I come to think of it, I'm not all that sure that I wasn't his most particular friend. But we used to stop and speak whenever we met. Well, bye-bye. I am rather surprised that you should attach importance to conversations apparently so trivial. They must have some hidden purpose, or else you wouldn't be showing them to me. Is that right? They could scarcely have any bearing on the death of Jacob, my old partner, for his death was in the past, and this is the future. I can't help but notice that this is my accustomed corner, and I, I see by the clock that this is my usual time of day for being here, but, but I see no likeness of myself. Not that I'm surprised, you understand. You see, I've been revolving in my mind air change of life, and I should like to think, that is, I rather hope, that my not being here is the result of my having carried out some, uh, re resolutions regarding... Let the charwoman alone to be the first, let the laundress alone to be the second, and let the undertaker's man alone to be the third. Look here, old Joe. Here's a chance. If we haven't all three met here without meaning it. You could have met in a better place. Come into the parlor. You made three of it long ago, you know. And you're the two ain't strangers. Stop till I shut the door of the shop. Ah, uh, the rain's such a rusty bit of metal in a place with its own inches, I believe. I'm sure there's no such old bones in here as mine. <laughs> We're all suitable to our calling. We're all well matched. Come into the parlor. Come into the parlour. What all it's then? What all it's Mrs. Dilbert? Every person has a right to take care of themselves. She always did. <laughs> That's true indeed. No man more so. Why then don't stand staring as if you was afraid, woman? Who's the wiser? We're not going to pick holes in each other's coats, I suppose. <laughs> no indeed. <laughs> we should hope not. Very well then, that's enough. Who's the worst for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. No, indeed. <laughs> if he wanted to keep them after he was dead, a oh, wicked old screw, why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd have somebody to look after him when he was struck with death, instead of lying gasping out his last there, alone, by himself. 
it. The truest word ever was spoke. It's a judgment on him. I wish it was a little heavier judgment than it should have been. You may depend upon it. If I could have laid my hands on anything else. Open that, Bonder, old Joe, and let me know the value of it. Speak out plain. I'm not afraid to be the first, nor afraid for them to see it. We know pretty well that we were helping ourselves before we met here, I believe. It's no sin. Open the bundle, Joe. A sailor too, a pencil case, a pair of slave buttons, and a brooch. Now, of no great value. That's your account, and I wouldn't give another sixpence if I was born for not doing it. Who's next? Sheets and towels, a bit of wearing apparel, two old-fashioned silver teaspoons, a pair of sugar tongs, and a few boots. This is disgusting. I can't look at this. Haven't you anything better to show me? I always give too much to ladies. It's a weakness of mine, and that's the way I've ruined myself. That's your account. If you had asked me for another penny and made an open question, I'd repent of being so liberal and knock off a half crown. And now on to my bundle, Joe. What do you call this? Bed curtains? <laughs> oh, bed curtains? You don't mean to say you took them down razor while they're lying there? Yes, I did. Why not? Eh. Rings and all. You were born to make your fortune and you'll certainly do it. I certainly shan't hold my hand when I can get anything in it by reaching it out. For the sake of such a man he was, I promise you. Joe, don't drop the oil upon the blankets now. His blankets? Whose else do you think isn't likely to take cold without them, I dare say. I hope you didn't die of anything catching, eh? <laughs> don't you be afraid of that. I ain't so fond of his company that I'd lauder about him for such things. If he did, ah, you may look through that shirt till your eyes ache won't find a hole in it, nor a threadbare place. It's the best he had, and a fine one too. They'd have wasted it if he hadn't been for me. What do you call wasting of it? Putting it on him to be buried in, to be sure. Somebody was fool enough to do it, but I took it off again. If calico ain't good enough for such a purpose, isn't it good enough for anything. It's quite as becoming to the body. He can't look uglier than he did in that one. <laughs> 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 this is the end of it, you see. He frightened everyone away from him when he was alive. To profit us when he was dead. <laughs> <laughs> Spirit. I see. I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way now. That, that is the lesson I am to draw from this poor man's fate, is it not? Merciful heaven, what is this? A bare, uncurtained bed? Something covered up for someone? Spirit, this is a frightful place. And leaving it, I shall not leave its lesson, trust me. Let us go. I understand you, and I would look at this dead man's face if I could. But I have not the power, spirit. I have not the power. If there is any person in the town who feels emotion caused by this man's death, show that person to me, spirit, I beseech you. Tell me the news. Is it good or bad? Bad. We are quite ruined? No, there is hope yet, Caroline. If he relents, there is. Nothing is past hope if such a miracle has happened. He is past relenting. He's dead. I am thankful in my soul to hear that. May God forgive me for having said such a thing. When I tried to see him and obtain a week's delay, his charwoman told me he was ill. And what I thought was a mere excuse to avoid me, turns out to have been quite true. He was not only very ill, but dying then. To whom will our debt be transferred? I don't know. But before that time, we shall be ready with the money. And even though we were not, it would be a bad fortune indeed to find so merciless a creditor and his successor. 
We may sleep tonight with light hearts, Caroline. So, it's a happier house for this man's death? Is that the only emotion you can show me pleasure? But then I don't suppose one can find much tenderness connected with a death. I will give you rest. Shall I stop bleeding, Mother? No, no. It's only the color, the black. It hurts my eyes. They're better now again. It makes them weak by candlelight, and I wouldn't show weak eyes to your father when he comes home for the world. It must be near his time. Past it, rather. But I think he has walked a little slower than he used to these last few evenings, Mother. I have known him walk. I have known him walk with Tiny Tim upon his shoulder very fast and day. And so have I. Often. But he was very light to carry, and his father loved him so that it was no trouble. No trouble. And there is your father at the door. I ran into Mrs. Scrooge's nephew in the street today. He thought I looked a little... J just a little down, you know. And he inquired as to what had happened to distress me. On which, for he is the pleasantest spoken gentleman you ever heard, I told him. I am heartily sorry for it, Mr. Cratchit, he said, and heartily sorry for your good wife. By the by, how we ever knew that, I don't know. Knew what? Why, that you were a good wife. Everybody knows that. I hope they do. Heartily sorry, he said, for your good wife. If I can be of service to you in any way, just let me know. And he handed me his card. Now it wasn't for the sake of anything he might be able to do for us, just much as for his kind way. That was quite delightful. It really seemed as if he had known our tiny Tim, and felt with us. I'm sure he's a good star. You would be sure of it if you saw and spoke to him. I shouldn't be surprised at all if he got Peter about the situation. Hear that, Peter? And then... Peter will be keeping company with someone and setting up for himself. Get along with you. It's just as likely as not. One of these days, though there is plenty of time for that. But however and whenever we part from one another, I am sure we shall none of us forget poor Tiny Tim, shall we? Or this first parting that there was among us. No! We'll never, we'll never forget him. Of course not. And I know... I know that when we recollect how patient and how mild he was, although he was a little, little child, we shall not quarrel easily among ourselves and forget poor Tiny Tim in doing it. No! Never, Father. No! I am very happy. I am very happy. My little, little child. Phantom, tell me what man that was whom we saw lying dead. Before I draw nearer to that headstone to which you point, answer me one question. Are these the shadows of the things that will be, or are they the shadows of things that may be only? Men's courses will foreshadow certain ends to which, if persevered in, they must lead. But if the courses be departed from, the ends will change. Say it is thus with what you show me. Ebenezer? What? Am I that man who lay upon the bed? No, spirit. Oh, no. No! Spirit, hear me. I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been but for this intervention. Why show me this if I am past all hope? But spirit, your nature intercedes for me and pities me. Show me that I yet may change these shadows you have shown me by an altered life. I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. 
the spirit of all three shall strive within me. I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Well, tell me that I may sponge away the writing on this stone. We will return to A Christmas Carol after these messages. I don't know what to do with my abuelita's things that I stole at the funeral. Wait! Have you heard of Old Man Joe's? Old Man Joe's? Old Man Joe will take anything you don't want from a recently deceased family member. Anything! Anything! Would he take Abuelita's knitting set? Anything! Her rocking chair? Anything! Her dentures? Almost anything? Make your way to Old Man Joe's today. We regret to inform you that Christmas caroling is now cancelled due to the unfortunate blinding of the over- The is will live on! Do not listen to them! We need to fight back! Don't let these greedy humbuggers take- It is take illegal! Yeah, it is! So are you! Christmas caroling is no more victory! No, it's not! Fight against the machine! Both of you need to we leave! We wish you a Merry Christmas! We I will wish spray you, Merry... you! You can blind us, but you will never silence our voices! We wish you Security! Conclusion of a Christmas Carol. I will live in the past, the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. Oh, Jacob Marley, heaven and the Christmas time be praised for this. I say it on my knees, old Jacob, on my knees. My bed curtains. They're not torn down. But they, they are not torn down, rings and all. They are here. I am here. The, the shadows of the things that would have been may be dispelled. They, they will be. I know they will. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I'm as light as a feather. I'm as happy as an angel. I am as merry as a schoolboy. I am as giddy as a drunken man. A Merry Christmas to everybody. A Happy New Year to all the world. <laughs> Hello there. Hello. There's the saucepan where the gruel was in. There's the door by which the ghost of Jacob Marley entered. There's the corner where the ghost of Christmas present sat. There's the window where I was saw this wandering spirit. It's all right. It's all true. It all happened. <laughs> I don't know what day of the month it is. I don't know how long I've been among the spirits. I don't know anything. I'm quite a baby. Never mind. I, I don't care. I'd rather be a baby. Hello. Whoop. Hello there! Plus clang hammer ding dong bell Bell ding dong hammer cling glass Oh glorious glorious Oh glorious glorious Whoop. Hello! What's the day? Eh? What's the day my fine fellow? Today? Why, it's Christmas Day. It's Christmas Day? I haven't missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night. They can do anything they like. Of course they can. Of course they can. Hello, my fine fellow. Hello. Do you know the poulterers in the street but one at the corner? I should hope I did. An intelligent boy. A remarkable boy. Do you know whether they sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? No, not the little prize turkey, the big one. What? The one as big as me? What a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk to him. Yes, my buck. It's hanging there now. Is it? Go and buy it. Uh, Walker. No. No, I am in earnest. Go and buy it and tell him to bring it here, that I may give them the directions to where to take it. Come back with the man and I'll give you a shilling. Come back with him in less than five minutes and I'll give you half a crown. <laughs> I'll send it to Bob Cratchit. He shan't know who sent it. It's twice the size of Tiny Tim. Joe Miller never made such a joke as sending it to Bob's will be. Here's the turkey. Hello. How are you? Merry Christmas. 
Why, it's impossible to carry that to Camden Town. You must have a cab. A Merry Christmas to you. God rest you, merry gentlemen, but nothing in this way. Mr. Scrooge? Yes, that is my name, and I fear it may not be pleasant to you. Allow me to ask your pardon, and will you have the goodness to accept me? Lord bless me! My dear Scrooge, are you serious? If you, if you please, not a farthing less. A great many back payments are included in it, I assure you. Will you do me that favor? My dear sir! I don't know what to say to such munificence. Don't say anything, please. Come and see me. W will you come and see me? We will. We will. Thank you. I am much obliged to you. I thank you 50 times. Bless you. Fred. Why, bless my soul. It's I, your Uncle Scrooge. It's your Uncle Scrooge. I've come as you asked. Will you let me in, Fred? Let you in? I... <laughs> oh, my God. Look at me. <laughs> you know, I've always wanted to meet you, Mr. Scrooge. The droll way in which your nephew portrays you has made me curious. I say, have you met... That's it. You're late. What do you mean by coming here at this time of day? I am very sorry, sir. I am behind my time. You are? Yes, I think you are. Step this way, if you please. It's only once a year, sir. It shall not be repeated. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now I'll tell you what, my friend. I am not going to stand this sort of thing any longer, and therefore, and therefore I am about to raise your salary. <gasps> a Merry Christmas, Bob, a merrier Christmas, Bob, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. I am going to raise your salary, and if you let me, I'd like to try to help your family. <laughs> Well, let's discuss it this afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking Bishop Bob. Make up the fire and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all, and infinitely more. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh, and little heeded them, for he was wise enough to know that nothing ever happened on this globe, for good, at which some people did not have their fill of laughter in the outset, and knowing that such of these would be blind anyway, he thought it was quite as well that they should wrinkle up their eyes and grins. His own heart laughed. That was quite enough for him. He had no further intercourse with the spirits, but lived up the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed that knowledge. May that be truly said of us, and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone.